Hi everyone, if we could just uh, take a seat up the back, those people. So welcome to Climate Update 2019. So my name's Sandy Carruthers, I'm the Executive Director of Science in the Department of Environment and Water, um, and I'll be chairing the first part of this um, session this evening. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if everyone could turn your phones onto silent, um, uh, but please don't put them away. Um, you can tweet using the hashtag Climate Update Adelaide 19, which is um, no, it's on the screen, yeah, on the screen above me. Um, in the case of an emergency, um, obviously the door's out the back that you came in and there's an uh, exit just here. Um, and the toilets are, if you go um, back out this building and around to the next building, um, there, there's some public um, toilets in that building over there. Um, and the other thing is if anyone needs a drink, there is a, a water fountain just um, if you walk backwards from this building towards the bike shed. Alright, so that's all that done. So. Um, the first session is State of the Climate, and then we'll have three, we'll have three speakers. Um, there'll be time for questions. We'll have a, a, like a one minute break, and then we'll start the second session. Um, but first up, it's my pleasure to introduce um, a Professor Bob Hill, Director of the Environment Institute here at the University of Adelaide, and he'll formally welcome you and give an acknowledgement to country. Thanks, Sandy. How about that? Yeah. Sorry, Sandy, you were speaking quite loudly, so I'm sure everybody, <laughs> everybody heard you, but it didn't sound like the microphone was coming through. Uh, so uh, firstly, welcome everybody for coming out on uh, uh, another summer's night, um, now that we're well into autumn. And thank you for turning out in such impressive numbers at reasonably short notice, especially at a time when there's so many events in Adelaide to attract your attention. It's both heartening and disturbing that an update on the current status of our climate has the capacity to attract so many people. I'd like to start uh, on your behalf by acknowledging and paying our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Mark Butler has been the Labor member for Port Adelaide in the Federal Parliament since 2007 and he's currently the Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. In the forthcoming election he'll be contesting the seat of Hindmarsh. Um, he'll probably become my local member <laughs> in the process. Um, and that's due to the abolition of the seat of Port Adelaide as South Australia's population declined relative to other states. I think we should get a prize for that rather than a penalty, but that's uh, the way it is. He's the author of Climate Wars, which makes a forceful case for using less and cleaner energy as part of global action to save the planet. It's my pleasure to welcome Mark Butler to the podium. Thank you. Is that working? Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, can I thank the Environment Institute of uh, the University of Adelaide here and also the Climate Institute, uh, Climate Change Institute from the ANU for inviting me to say a few brief words uh, at the opening of this seminar. This is a beautiful lecture theatre. I'm, I did my degrees at the University of Adelaide. We did not have lecture theatres like this. Uh, so this is a beautiful theatre. Thank you all for coming along during Mad March to talk about this really important topic. Uh, and it's a really important time to be talking about this as we lead into a federal election, but uh, with a slightly longer term focus because over the last 12 months or so, the science about the need to take strong action on climate change has, if anything, become clearer and it's become more urgent. We've seen uh, a, a, a flurry of very compelling reports at a global level and here nationally in Australia setting out very clearly what is already happening to our climate as a result of global warming, but uh, more disturbingly setting out what is going to happen if we don't take very strong action to control climate change. As I'm sure you know, the IPCC's report that it was asked to conduct after the Paris Agreement about the impacts of 1.5 degrees of global warming and 2 degrees of global warming was an incredibly confronting report. It showed that 2 degrees, which I think too often is thought about as a relatively safe level of global warming, 
uh, would wipe out, for example, more than 99% of the world's coral reefs, including obviously the Great Barrier Reef, which is one of the seven natural wonders of the world for which we Australians have stewardship, but is also an incredibly important driver of economic activity up the coast of Queensland. The World Bank had previously said that two degrees, just two degrees of global warming, would lead to a cut of about 20 per cent in cereal production across the globe. Very disturbingly, a cut of 50 per cent in cereal production on the continent of Africa, which is going to experience almost all of the net increase in global population over the coming three dec or decades or so. And the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO, two of our preeminent scientific agencies here in Australia, only a couple of months ago published their two yearly state of the climate report, which again set out very clearly what is already happening to the Australian climate. We're seeing a very disturbing structural decline, not just in rainfall in the Murray-Darling Basin area and in the wheat belt in Western Australia, but more disturbingly, a very deep reduction in stream flow. So the actual, the, the water that actually reaches into the river system and is able to be used for agriculture. Our two primary agricultural regions suffering very substantial reductions in rainfall and stream flow over the last four decades, as well as a, an extended and more intense fire season, very substantial impacts on our coastal communities through sea level rise and so on and so forth. Uh, and these impacts or these reports were delivered in a year, 2018, which was one of the five warmest years on record in the world. The other four being 2017, 2016, 2015 and 2014. We're starting to get the picture here that something very serious is happening to our planet. And I think the broader community in Australia is starting to get the picture. I've been in Parliament since 2007. I've had this portfolio for five or six years and I've never seen the level of community expectation for national action on climate change, and particularly for Canberra or the Australian Parliament to take national action on climate change at its current level since 2007, since you saw a very substantial burst of community expectation towards the back end of the millennium drought, which even caused John Howard to take an emissions trading scheme to the 2007 federal election, an election when an emissions trading scheme was actually a subject of bipartisan agreement between the two major parties. But against all of this that we've read about over the last 12 months, just really pulling together a lot of stuff we've been reading about for several years, Australia's performance in this area is consistently rated as very poor. In the annual climate change performance index, which is reported in, out of Europe, uh, Australia has consistently rated, and again last year rated, at about 55th out of the 60 most uh, significant countries or economies in the world. 55th out of 60. The OECD, so, you know, a pretty orthodox economic body at an international level, uh, only a few weeks ago rated Australia's performance on climate change very poor, its policy settings as inadequate, and indicated its view that Australia was nowhere near on track to reach what are already modest, inadequate targets for emissions reduction by 2030, the Paris targets that Tony Abbott put in place. And interestingly, Allianz, one of the world's largest insurers that publishes a very regular climate and energy monitor as well. The insurance industry obviously has a particular insight into what is happening across the globe. Uh, it tracked all of the G20 nations, so the 20 largest economies, in November or December last year, and rated Australia as 20th out of the G20 in terms of our compliance with our Paris targets. So, very orthodox, certainly we're not talking Greenpeace here, we're not talking WWF, we're talking very orthodox economic agencies consistently rating Australia as poor on this matter. And the data from the government, although if you watched Insiders yesterday you might have seen a slightly different picture presented by the Energy Minister Angus Taylor, the government's own data says exactly that. When we were in government, we had the carbon price mechanism, I'm from the Labor Party by the way, when we were in government and we had the carbon price mechanism in place, uh, greenhouse gases or carbon pollution came down by about 11% in six years. It worked. The renewable energy target worked. The carbon price mechanism worked. The land clearing restrictions that Queensland and New South Wales Labor governments had put in place, they worked as well. And completely unsurprisingly, when Tony Abbott tore up, dismantled all of that architecture 
in 2014, carbon pollution started to rise again. It's been rising ever since, and it's projected on the government's own data to, to continue to rise all the way to 2030. We are now pretty much the only major advanced economy in the world where greenhouse gases are going up rather than coming down. Policy matters in this area. Across Australia, if you travel around, I have the great honour of being able to travel around in this job. Businesses, and particularly individual households, are taking their own action. We have two million houses now with rooftop solar. That's more houses than America has with rooftop solar, a population of 330 million or something. Uh, when we came to government in 2007, there were only 7,400 houses across the whole country that had rooftop solar. So individuals are taking action, businesses are starting to take action. But what I think those data show about the impact of Tony Abbott dismantling all of our climate policy is that government policy does matter. And across every sector of the economy now, we are going in the wrong direction because we have no policy out of Canberra that caps let alone forces big industry, the big polluters, to reduce their carbon pollution levels. They're completely free to continue increasing their carbon pollution output, and they're doing that. There is no policy at all to control pollution from our transport sector, so we are now the only OECD economy that does not have pollution standards on our cars and our light commercial trucks. 80% of cars sold around the world are sold into markets that require certain constraints on carbon pollution emissions from cars and light commercial trucks. We now, in our showrooms, our car showrooms, have dirtier versions of the global platforms being sold here in Australia than legally would be able to be sold in the US, Canada, the UK, Western Europe, Japan, and very shortly China as well. Low hanging fruit that the government could, if it had the will, deal with very, very quickly. So government policy does matter. And the other thing that I'd ask you to think about over the course of this seminar, uh, unconnect, uh, quite, quite closely connected to this, is that facts matter as well. Uh, and this is where I think the research community and the university sector become so important as this debate around climate policy revs up in the lead into the election that's due in May. Facts really do here, and facts and respect for the scientific method uh, and the rigour of our researchers um, have taken a battering over the last 10 or 15 years. Only this morning I read just a few articles on climate policy uh, in, um, in newspapers overseen by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, one of them, for example, said that, um, that uh, achieving the Paris targets on emissions reduction to keep global warming below two degrees is consistent with having coal-fired power continue at its current rates up to 2040. Utter rubbish complete crap, if you forgive my language. The International Energy Agency, again not Greenpeace, but the peak body for the energy sector itself, says that to keep global warming below two degrees, OECD economies like ours will have to be out of unabated coal-fired power by the mid-2030s. Coal-fired power will have reduced, depending on whether they can put carbon capture and storage into the system, by somewhere between 50 and 80 per cent by 2040 won't be anything near the current levels, which is really, that debate is what, what is really, I can only see minutes left, right, two minutes, you had your hand over the two, which is really <laughs> driving the debate over Adani. Another article just this morning said, if we're going to continue to increase our levels of renewable energy, we're going to have to build 770 big batteries of the type we see up in the north of South Australia, which will cost $63 billion. Complete rubbish. And we're going to need some pumped hydro, we're going to need some other big batteries in the system. But a very credible former senior Treasury economist, founder of Access Economics, writes this rubbish in the newspapers and it's treated as gospel. Um, another thing that was written only last week, that a 45% cut in pollution, which is Labor's policy by 2030, would cost the economy $273 billion. Absolute rubbish. We've seen from research from the CSIRO and a range of other very reputable economists that the old link between economic growth and emissions growth has been broken. It has been broken around the world over the last 20 years. Now in the election, in the lead up to the election, these things are all going to be ventilated and that's a good thing. We want this election to be in significant part about climate change and energy. Obviously it's going to be about health policy and education policy and a range of other things as well. 
but we want there to be a substantial debate here. Uh, we'd like there to be a foreseeable possibility of the consensus of the type you see in the UK. I don't think that's likely. This is going to be an argument that is, that is, that is heavily infected by hyperbole, by made-up facts and by a lack of respect for scientific method for the first time I've seen in my life. Uh, and so uh, it is time, I think, that we all started speaking out about um, a proper approach to research, a proper approach to policy making, uh, and some respect again for a vast community of scientists who really for decades now in Australia have played an incredibly important leading role as the global community tries to, tries to come to grips with the enormity of the challenge of climate change and global warming. Thanks very much for having me. I wish you all the best for your seminar. Can you hear me th this time? Okay. Um, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, so, so does anyone have got time for a couple of questions? So, yes, the lady up the, in, in the middle. Oh, sorry. You get to ask me questions all the time. <laughs> Mark, what's the government got in place for policy? As the sea level rises, we're going to get backward flows of rivers and creeks all around Australia taking salinity further inland, impacting our aquifers even further, what policies are in place uh, and what do they plan to do to help mitigate this? Well, um, sea level rise is, uh, Mark can talk about this far more coherently than me and others I'm sure, but sea level rise is one of the really tricky parts of climate at the moment because uh, many countries, including Australia, are operating on the basis of estimates of sea level rise over the course of this century that I think have become outdated. Most scientists um, take the view they've become outdated. We're generally working to planning regimes around 50 centimetres of sea level rise over the course of this century. Uh, NOAA, for example, the, the Oceanic uh, um, Administration, yeah, the, the, the Oceanic version of NASA in the US sees their intermediate um, estimate to be more like a metre. So, so we, we do have a need to start to update our thinking about sea level rise. The IPCC is doing some more work, as I understand it, for their sixth assessment report, but that's not due to 22, 23, a couple of years at least. Uh, and um, so this, I think, is a really important debate for a country that has so much of its community on the coast. The other problem we have, though, is that the, the um, climate adaptation framework that Penny Wong set up 10 years ago to, to deal with things like this, to do research into the impact on our water systems of sea level rise and such like, has again been completely defunded. So, so in 2013, towards the end of our government, it was doing about 100, I think it did about 115 research papers that year covering things like this. In 2014, it did one. Uh, and after that it's done zero because it was completely defunded. Um, so, so what we need to do uh, if we win the coming election is really start to rebuild an adaptation framework that starts to come to grips with these questions and the impact on coastal planning and development but also on water systems that are adjacent to the coast effectively off a blank sheet of paper because for four or five years there just hasn't been any national work done in this area. I know some state governments have been doing work, but there's been nothing coordinated across the whole country. And just one more quick question. So, gentlemen, not that. So, yeah. <laughs> Can you speak loudly? Maybe just... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I just just looking at the, uh, the the handout that came out tonight, and looking at the trajectories of emissions reduction, um, I actually think that even a 45% reduction isn't enough. Um, you know, for example, if the people don't know, but if the CO2 reaches 480 ppm, which is one of the lower trajectories on that chart, it starts to dissolve calcite, which means you have total ecosystem collapse in the oceans, and um, we'll hit that by about 2060. I even it, do, do you guys, uh, would you see 45% as a stepping stone to something much greater, perhaps a trajectory towards zero? Well, um, so, so, so Labor, Labor's position is, which we enunciated back in 2015, is um, uh, uh, after the Paris conference, was for a commitment to net zero emissions by the middle of the century. 
uh, which is, we think, um, uh, required by the Paris Agreement, and a 45 per cent cut by 2030. And that was the advice of the Climate Change Authority. And, and the, the authority, which is a statutory authority to advise Parliament on these matters, essentially extrapolated that number from the global carbon budget that the IPCC had developed and worked out a national share for that. Now, I mean, I think the, the, the most important point is to have a commitment, a longer term commitment to net zero. Now, there will be, I think, um, given that Paris has, has adjusted the, the, the commitment um, from below two degrees to way below two degrees. Now, I, for one, don't know quite what that means, is if that's 1.8 or 1.75 or 1.85. And I think over time, the IPCC is going to have to recalculate their budget. And we, at a national level here, are going to have to do that as well. But at the moment, there's, you know, there's, no, there's no energy being focused on this from the current government. So 45 per cent was the position advised us by the Climate Change Authority. We, we did a we did a consultation about that and accepted their advice. The latest data, projections from the government suggest, from, from the Department of the Environment, suggest we're currently projecting towards a 7 per cent cut um, below 2005 levels. Uh, so, you know, 45 per cent is quite a substantial improvement uh, on BAU over the course of the 2020s. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to have to leave. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? That's okay. So can, can we say, please say th thank you to Mark? <laughs> All right, so um, now I'd like to introduce Professor Mark Howden, the director at the um, ANU's Climate Change Institute. And um, Mark's going to provide an overview of changes to our climate in 2018. So um, thanks very much, uh, Mark, for that um, leading uh, presentation. And, uh, thanks, Bob, for the um, opportunity to partner with you down here. Uh, and thanks, Sandy, too, for the introduction. And uh, it's uh, really great to see everyone here tonight. Um, and just before I start, I'd just uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners on who, the land on who we meet and, uh, and, and acknowledge their um, achievements in managing uh, their transition through climate change themselves as they went into and out of the last ice age. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, is a little different from uh, Mark's presentation, is that I'm just going to talk a bit about the science, um, and, and the theme here is build, building momentum. So it's about the momentum within the science, um, it's about the momentum within the climate change system, and it's also about momentum in terms of public and other um, activities and perspectives. So a very quick start on this is... Uh, the fundamentals, which is the carbon dioxide emissions, which is the major greenhouse gas that we're producing as uh, human beings, and looking at how that's changed over the years. So if you look at this graph, which comes from the Global Carbon Project, which is run out of Canberra, um, this goes back to 1990. We can see the emissions going up. Um, there was a little blip here. That was the uh, fin global financial crisis, uh, almost no impact on emissions, uh, rapid uh, recovery until it was pretty much where it would have been before, there was a bit of a flattening out here. Um, that was particularly associated with uh, um, introduction of uh, fracking and, and uh, natural gas and, and coal seam gas to replace coal in the US, but also various other changes throughout the globe. Um, but more recently, there's been a, an uptick um, in the last couple of years, uh, with last year having a 2.7% increase across the globe of these emissions. And as, as was just uh, presented to us, if we are to meet the Paris Agreement, instead of those emissions going up, they at some stage have to level out and go down. That's pretty basic. And the faster, <clears throat> the faster they level out and go down, uh, the easier it is to, be, it is to actually achieve any particular um, temperature target, like 1.5 or 2 degrees. At current rates of emissions, uh, it'll only be about a dozen years before we use up our complete carbon budget across the globe and then we have to go cold turkey in terms of emissions if we are to stay to 1.5 degrees. That would trash the whole 
global economy, of course, and so we're not going to do that. The sort of trajectory that Mark Butler just talked about, which is a, a slower decline, so still pretty steep, 45% by 2030, net zero by 2050, is actually consistent with a 1.5 degrees target. And, uh, and so at the moment, we're not heading anywhere near that. We're actually heading, even if all countries uh, complied with their Paris Agreement commitments, we're still heading to roughly about three to three and a half degrees temperature increase. At the moment, we're about one degree above the long-term baseline. And to put that in context is that three degrees may not sound much, particularly if you're in Adelaide when, you know, the difference between 38 and 40, <laughs> 41 degrees, it's seriously hot either way. But three degrees is actually huge in a global climatological sense. So the, t um, the difference between temperatures in the last ice age and our historical temperatures is only five degrees. So five degrees downwards gives you an ice age. We're hitting sort of the same sorts of temperatures, but on the other side of the ledger. It's a fundamental and a huge change in the global climate system. So if we are to achieve anything like the Paris Agreement goals, 1.5 or 2 degrees, it will take fundamental and transformative change in many aspects of our society, in our transport systems, energy systems, food systems, etc. So we're t talking about really significant change. If we look at what is happening in terms of Australia as emissions, uh, as um, Mark Butler just mentioned, there was a, a recent release just in the last couple of days of our quarterly greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so this is the, the trace. We see um, emissions peaking around 2007, 2008, uh, a long decline um, as those policies cut in, and then a steady increase over the most recent years from 2013 onwards. A little downwards tick, which is the um, uh, source of some debate uh, on, on uh, insiders the other day and, and various other places, um, but the long-term trend at the moment is going upwards. Part of the reason why we had that downwards tick was, in fact, that there were fewer emissions from the electricity sector, so renewables are cutting in. Um, but part of it also was because the drought was impacting on agriculture and driving down agricultural activity and driving down greenhouse gas emissions. So insofar as that is actually linked to climate change, part of the reason why we're actually seeing that little downtick is actually um, related to climate change. So an interesting thing there. But if we look at the last financial year, like the rest of the world, Australia's emissions went up, it went up around about the same proportion, 2.3%. So we're not heading in the right direction. And we've known for a long, long time that if we keep on producing gases like carbon dioxide, um, they accumulate in the atmosphere. So for every ton of carbon dioxide that we emit, roughly speaking, a third of that gets absorbed by the oceans, a third of that gets absorbed by trees and grass and soils, and a third of that sits in the atmosphere. And it accumulates year after year after year, and it will hang around for a couple of hundred years. And that's why we're seeing this sort of trend to increase uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This goes back about 13 years. You can get, take this back hundreds of thousands of years if you want. But you can see there's a long, steady increase. Um, and last year was the record levels we've um, measured historically. And it's not just carbon dioxide, but it's also other gases like meth methane in this case. Uh, this graph goes back about 30 years. You can see there's a couple of periods of sustained increase. Um, and this increases up here, and that's particularly associated, it seems, with industrial emissions. And so those two key greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, are both at record levels in our atmosphere. And unsurprisingly, um, we, what we're seeing as a result is that the temperature of the globe is increasing. So this is a, a graph that comes out of the last IPCC special report um, uh, released in October of last year. It goes back to 1850 over here up to the present, and what that shows is four pieces of information. Uh, this little sort of bluish line here is the best estimate of natural uh, temperature forcing, and these little dips here are where you get a volcano. So when a volcano erupts, it uh, puts in particulates in the atmosphere which cools the atmosphere because it reflects the sunlight. And so when you get a volcano, it temporarily cools the globe. But you can see the long-term trend here is pretty much flat line. If anything, it's actually slightly downwards. In contrast, the orange line is the human influence, the best estimate of human influence through greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see that goes up and up, and it's in fact exponential, similar to the greenhouse gas emissions we're seeing. The red line here is the best estimate based on the, the combination of the natural and the human influences. And you can see 
uh, based compared with the observations, which is the wiggly line going through here, that the best estimate of the combination of natural and human influences matches very closely the observed record. And this plus other information, statistical analyses, indicate that there's less than a one in 100,000, maybe less than a one in a million chance that this is not due to human influence. So we are impacting on the globe in very substantial ways. Um, as we heard just before, um, that the fourth warmest year on record was last year, 2018. Uh, it was clustered in amongst the most recent years uh, with the um, hottest on record. So we are impacting significantly on the globe, and that's happening pretty much everywhere. So this is, again, um, a picture of temperatures last year with a couple of exceptions up near um, uh, Greenland um, and down near Antarctica. Um, everywhere warms. There is no escape. This is global warming. You can't go somewhere and not be affected by this. So we have no plan planet B. Um, we are affected wherever we are. And this was a little uh, interesting little graph which shows the same sort of information about temperature um, variability. And I'll just run through this before I, I start the animation. Um, but this runs from 1900 um, up to the present time. So this is a time bar, which you'll see moving in a second. This is the temperature anomalies across the globe from um, every site across the globe that they accumulated. So in 1900, on average, the temperature was, the most frequent temperature was about zero degrees. There were some places which were colder, there were some places which were hotter, and that's reflected in this little part of the graph here. So this is the equator, this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, and this is the temperature at each grid square across the globe. Um, that was experienced in that particular year. So um, up here, you see that there was some places which were two degrees hotter. Down here, there were some places which were roughly two degrees cooler. The difference between the coolest and the hottest is about four degrees Celsius. So as we run through this little animation, um, just see how things change. I call this the wobbling jellyfish diagram for obvious reasons. And just this little animation I find both fascinating and scary at the same time. So if we actually look at the end, so this is last year, um, you can see that the average temperature or most frequent temperature, the mode, has increased significantly. It's about half a degree hotter. But the really startling thing is this really hot tail of, of um, temperatures, where now we're getting places which are four or five degrees. And if that went out to six degrees, you'd get some out here as well. Um, but the other part, which is really interesting, it's not just the average which has gone up but it's the variance which has changed. So if you remember that in the first year, the difference between a hot and a cold year was about four degrees. Now the coldest years are around about minus three and the hottest are plus five. So the total variance being experienced is now eight degrees. So it's twice what it was about a century ago. So that's the part of the story here. It's not just about climate averages, it's about that variation increasing really significantly. The cold getting colder and the hot getting hotter. And in part, that's associated with things like um, the polar vortex that um, some people decry. So just a quick rundown in terms of what happened in 2018 in terms of sea surface temperatures. So this is uh, um, at the start of 2000, um, 2018. You can see it actually started out relatively cool. There was a weak La Nina sitting across the Pacific. So that's that cold tongue here, um, a bit of cold water um, sitting around uh, uh, South Africa here, um, and, but, but quite a hot um, sort of patch sitting between Australia and New Zealand. If we zoom to the end of the year, you can see that picture's changed. Um, so that cold tongue across the Pacific has disappeared. Um, that uh, patch around southern Africa has disappeared. And on average, right across the globe, you're seeing a lot more um, yellows and orange colours. And in spite of that fact, it wasn't, it wasn't exceptionally hot across the globe, but in spite of that, we actually had record number of cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons last year. So more than we've ever recorded before. Interestingly, there's new research which actually shows that not only are those increasing in intensity, so there's more and more damaging category four and five cyclones and typhoons and hurricanes, but also they're moving more slowly and particularly they're more moving more slowly when they cross over our cities. 
So our cities actually increase the surface roughness under those cyclones and it slows them down. So you have that situation um, which occurred in um, Hurricane Florence last year in, in Miami um, when it just basically stopped and kept on dumping um, for day after day after day, causing extreme floods. It not only caused extreme floods, it also generated some of the best quotes of the year um, from our friend over in the US. And, and you can see the quality of, of uh, inc incisiveness that comes from some of the analysis here. And, but, but these things are really important, is the fact that we, and we also then saw this just the other day in Townsville. Um, where we had that intense system and instead of moving on and just dumping and then moving on, it just dumped and kept on dumping and dumping and dumping and in Western um, Queensland, dumping and dumping and dumping in the same place. So that change in the way that systems move and the way in which rain falls is really important. And in terms of the ocean, we've actually seen a really set, set of really interesting science coming out in the last year or so. So some of that is about ocean warming and how fast it's accelerating. But before we get to that story, one of the stories here is that the assessment of how much heat there is in the ocean got boosted up, not by 4 or 5%, but by about 40% last year because of new information coming from the Argo floats. But when we took that into account and looked at the change in the frequency of um, uh, warming, or a change in the rate of warming, the warming across the oceans of the world are actually going up five times faster now than they were back in the 70s to 90s five times faster. That's an incredible increase in the rate. And by itself, by the end of this century, just that warming of our oceans, the expansion of the water that comes from that warming, will give rise to about 30 centimetres of sea level. Just that warming alone, without melting of Greenland, etc., etc. So those things are, are, are really um, starting to cut in. And unsurprisingly, what we're seeing is that we're getting a larger number of marine heat waves. And again, this is uh, really new science. So if you look at the top panels, <clears throat> that's the sort of the, um, the historical, oh, that's the one degree scenario, that's two degrees, and then we get two different scenarios, three and a half degrees down here. But when people actually, the authors of this study actually analysed it, they found that between the 1980s and the current time, there's actually a doubling of the f number of marine heat wave days. So these are very hot days in the oceans. And something like 86% of those um, events which are happening now are attributable to human influence. They're attributable to climate change. But the really scary part of this study was the future. And so if we go to the three and a half degrees, which is roughly where we're heading um, with our Paris Agreement commitments, let alone if we break our Paris Agreement commitments, and if you actually look at this scale here, you know, 30, 40, 60, that's a 60-fold number of increase in marine heat waves around Australia and to our north. And it's inconceivable that that frequency of increase in heat waves will not have huge impacts on our marine ecosystems throughout that region. So this isn't a factor of one or two. This is a factor of 30, 40, 50, 60. That is seriously scary. And we've had a lot more information coming out on um, ice sheets and ocean science in the last year. So if you look at Antarctica, what we've seen over the last few decades is a tripling of the rate of melt from about 53 billion tonnes to 159 billion tonnes a year, um, and a more than a fourfold increase in the loss of ice shelf collapses. And there's particular um, research associated with that, which I thought was really interesting, because it started to understand what was the ice, ice shelf collapse triggers that were really important. And one of them was the amount of sea ice sitting in front of those ice shelves, because that actually buffers um, those ice shelves and, and also buffers the glaciers, glaciers there. And what we're seeing in the Antarctic is an absolute precipitous drop in the amount of sea ice sitting around Antarctica in the last couple of years. And the other thing was um, that big waves actually really significantly erode um, those ice shelves. And what we saw again last year uh, in measurements off New Zealand was the biggest ever wave recorded in the southern hemisphere. And that was 24 metres. So to put that in context, that's like the height of an eight-storey building. And so when you've got those sorts of waves which are building up in energy, so on average they're going up in energy across the globe, that starts to trigger more and more ice sheet loss. So we've got multiple things happening in the Antarctic and we've got multiple things happening in Greenland. And the rate of 
breakdown of the Greenland ice sheet is really scary. We're seeing massive amounts of ice, um, ice and water loss from Greenland every year now. And so it's now contributing more than a third of the total um, increase in sea level rise that we're observing um, in recent years, so, which is now over three millimetres a year. So these are really, really significant changes and, and they're happening really, really fast. So it's unsurprising when you're getting um, Arctica, Antarctica um, breaking down, Greenland breaking down, that we see more and more sea level rise. And unsurprisingly somewhat is that last year was in fact the record sea level ever recorded. Uh, historically, that is, of course. And so these things matter and they accumulate and they're measurable and they are pretty concerning because this is already impacting on systems around the globe. Now, to go from a global down to an Australian context, um, so last year, uh, 2018, was our third warmest on record. Um, we had, and that was sitting around 1.14 degrees across the nation um, above the baseline. So the Bureau of Meteorology's baseline is 1961 to 1990, so it's a relatively recent baseline. If you want to put it in the context of the Paris Agreement historical baseline, that's the um, pre-industrial baseline, you have to add about 0.3 degrees. So if you adjust for Paris-type numbers, last year we were sitting around 1.4 degrees, remembering that the lower Paris goal is 1.5. And so last year we had heat waves. We had them in January, April, November and December. There was a whole stack of new temperature records set, many of which were set here in South Australia and Adelaide. We have seen a five-fold increase in the number of extreme heat days since the 1950s across Australia, not one time, 1.5 times or two times, but fivefold. Um, but at the same time we're seeing extreme heat, we're also seeing extreme damaging frost. And so, and that's also associated with climate change and that particularly impacts on South Australia and Victoria. And like the globe, warming is happening almost everywhere. You can't really go anywhere in Australia and avoid that climate change. And there's a link here, of course, to temp um, rainfall. So if we look at rainfall last year, it was really low across the southeast, had a few little patches which were above um, the long-term average. But climate change comes in packages. And as Seth will talk about in a later talk, it's when you get drought conditions, you also get high temperature conditions and you also are primed to have really serious fires as being experienced in Victoria right now. So last year wasn't exceptionally dry, um, but there's a lot of people who suffered nevertheless. Um, and, and we also, as well as being extremely dry, we also suffered extreme floods in places like Hobart and Sydney and others. And last year, there was effectively a fire year. So in, in various places, um, we actually didn't have a fire season, uh, a, a season without fires. So there were fires in the middle of winter and serious fires in the middle of winter right through eastern Australia. So we go into a situation where we move away from the concept of a fire season to a fire year now. In Adelaide last year, um, it was about, it wasn't seriously hot on average compared with you know, the long-term average, it was the eighth warmest, but it was 1.6 degrees Celsius above the average. This summer, um, it far exceeds that, as you probably have all recently experienced. We've had several extreme hot uh, weather records broken in Adelaide last year. Um, the nights in particular were warm, and, and so there's no recovery from the hot weather. Um, and Rainfall, some months were high, some months were low, but on average it was a little bit dry. And I just mentioned briefly um, this climate coaster that you all got, um, or hopefully all got, when you're coming in the door. Um, so this is just an encapsulation of, uh, of the data for one year. Um, this is the maximum temperature data. So, so the shape of the outside gives you month by month the temperature anomaly, that's the temperature above the average. So for example, for April, it was 4.1 degrees above the long-term average. And this little um, squiggle in the middle is actually your daily temperature um, through, throughout the year um, associated with those temperatures. So that little piece of information um, sitting in that um, coaster, which is sustainably um, generated, of course, um, uh, gives you a feel for how exceptional each year is, year by year. Now, I just want to move quickly. I know I'm running short of time, but uh, we'll just chew into Q&A a little bit. Um, if we look at the insurance um, system, so the insurance industry really does total up um, impacts of climate change. Last year, it was the fourth biggest insurance losses um, ever, so that's 80 billion, um, and it was in the worst 10 in terms of uninsured losses, so that's where damage happened, but it wasn't insured. 
Some of the events um, were listed just here. So there was hurricanes and typhoons um, in various places. We had large-scale flood events um, in different uh, continents. Um, the horrendous fires over in California, um, but also in Greece. Um, and droughts and storms in Europe and, and storms here in Australia, like the Sydney hailstorm. So the insurance industry is seriously concerned about this, and they see their risks changing, and of course their premiums have to change. And so this, the importance of this is that even if you don't believe in climate change, you are still going to be paying for it. You can't avoid it if you insure yourself. So this is a really important uh, sort of issue, particularly when you start thinking about multiple hazards. And so as I mentioned before, climate change doesn't come in singles, it comes in packages. And this is the first study which actually tried to look at those multiple packages, the multiple hazards that can arise from climate change. And, and what this just did was for each particular um, sort of um, event, such as um, uh, fires or droughts, etc., it would sort of map out the future risk of these and then give an aggregate map, which you can see that um, those places north of Australia and south, across South Asia and East Africa, which is our territory, you know, it's our neighbourhood, um, are really, really badly impacted in terms of multiple climate um, hazards. And this study showed that by 2080, something like about 50% of the global population will experience three or more climate-related hazards on average each year, whereas at the moment it's less than half a hazard experienced by the same proportion of population. So really significant changes in exposure. Um, so the question then is, you know, what do we do about it and how do we respond as a society? And I just like this cartoon, you know, there's two things that cause climate change, human activity and human inactivity. And um, we can't afford the second one in particular. So what's happening in terms of Australia and public um, perceptions about climate change? So there's various studies that cover this. So this one's the Lowy Institute survey result, um, and, in, and, and which I think is pretty reliable, and it's a long-term study. And what that shows is that last year um, we had about 60% of Australians saying that they think climate change is a serious issue and we should take steps now, even if it's costly. About 30% said there's gradual effects from climate change, we should take low-cost steps, and only less than 10%. Um, effectively, he said climate change was not an issue, don't worry about it. So you add the first two numbers up and you've got 90% of Australians want action on climate change. And it's not just the grey hairs like me, but really importantly I think it's that young people are wanting action. So that picture up the top is Greta Thunberg, Swedish girl, 16 years old, generating a whole groundswell of change in terms of climate change right across the globe, including in Australia. And so we have kids strikes, school, school, school kids strikes in Australia, um, generating amongst other things some really fascinatingly insightful placards. And, um, but this is really important. Um, this is their future and they know, they've actually done their homework and they know that climate change is not good news for them. They know they're going to inherit a planet which is not in as good shape as that we inherited a planet. And business is really concerned about this as well. So if you look at the um, Australian Institute of Company Directors, um, they did their recent survey and they said climate change is the number one issue for the long term that the federal government needs to address. You've got companies like Woodside, Rio Tinto, BHP calling for a carbon price again. Um, we have Sanjeev Gupta down here saying there's a huge amount of money to be made out of climate change. Let's innovate. Let's actually make this an opportunity. And you've got um, groups like AMO saying that uh, renewables are now cheaper, new renewables are now cheaper than coal um, and they will continuously get cheaper. So this is generating a whole series of, of responses in the business community and it's not just the big end of town. So you've got people like Peter Mailer who's a farmer up at Gundawindi in southern Queensland saying this, solar farming is better money, safer money, easier money than farming given the clim climate change that he's observing. And this is a really fundamental change. Someone who's moving away from generations of traditional farming on his land and thinking about this completely differently. A really significant change. And across the globe we've seen government responses varied. So um, a headline here, the Morrison's government's biggest um, issue is climate change denial. One sort of set of issues. We've got New York City um, suing ExxonMobil um, uh, because of deception, deceptive conduct that they uh, ran um, decades ago. And we've got uh, jurisdictions like the ACT and South Australia and Adelaide City actually going to net zero really, really quickly 
world leaders in terms of this. And you've got people like the arts community um, getting really concerned and frustrated um, that their voices aren't being heard. And pushing this against government continuously. Different perspectives, but all heading in the same way. So just a real quick summary is that, to summarise what I've said here, is that climate change is accelerating and it's due to human influence. The climate impacts are increasingly a near and present danger. This is not something for 2050 or even 2030. This is something for right now that we need to deal with. In general, those emission reduction responses or adaptation responses are inadequate to actually keep pace with the pace of climate change. Climate change and the accumulation of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is going apace, and we are just simply not keeping up with that. But the last part of my talk is there is increased momentum for change right across the board, right across our society, and this can provide new opportunities, but only if we work together. And the little last picture here is just a real simple question. If they can do it, why can't we? Thank you very much. That was a really fantastic summary of a whole lot of really important information, so that's great. I might not sleep tonight, though. So <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit scary. I feel a bit yeah. anxious. Um, all right, so I might, I might just hand over to Seth, and then we'll okay. do some questions at the end. Sure. Okay, so can you hear me? Can everyone... Can you hear me, everyone? Um, so I'll just introduce Professor, Professor Seth Westra. Um, so Seth is from the University of Adelaide. And Seth will be describing the intricate links between climate change and the water cycle. And then we'll have some questions at the end. Okay, so over the next little while, um, I'll be talking about the links between climate change and the water cycle. And perhaps it's my bias, I guess, as a water engineer and a hydrologist, but I would argue that changes to the water cycle are going to be where some of the most important impacts of climate change are going to be felt. Whether it's in terms of things like droughts, changes to floods and storms and cyclones, even things like heat waves and fires are linked in a very close way to changes in the water cycle. The productivity of our agriculture is very much linked to water availability, as many of you know. The sustainability of our energy supplies is also increasingly linked to our hydroelectricity, pumped hydro, and other elements that have a significant water element. And so I want to talk about that connection, but the aim of this presentation is not just to tell you that there's a link, because I think that's something that hopefully um, becomes fairly clear. I would also like to tell you a little bit about what we might expect here in South Australia um, in terms of what might occur. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to talk a bit about how we might start making decisions and start adapting um, to some of these very significant changes uh, that you've already been hearing about. So just to start with the fundamentals, how is the climate actually connected with water? So this diagram is a fairly old diagram that's, that's, that you see in a lot of textbooks, and it basically represents um, what's known as the global energy balance. And basically what you can see here, and let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, which button is that? Oh, that's obviously not the way to do it. Um, as you can see here, um, the incoming solar radiation um, is, is, is the energy, I guess, that comes into our planet from, from the sun. And if that is balanced by the amount of solar radiation that's either reflected back out or taken out as long-wave radiation, you have the temperatures in the planet staying stable. So, of course, the problem, is, you know, the problem of climate change is really in this diagram, and we know what the problem is. It's the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing um, this the fluxes of energy and how they move around our planets to change in fairly complex ways, that's basically meaning uh, that the total temperature of the planet is getting warmer. But the reason I want to talk about this diagram is not just because of a fundamental lesson in, in how climate change works. I really want to focus on what the connection is with the water cycle. And there's, in fact, a lot of different connections in terms of how changes in the energy balance will impact water. It might surprise some of you to learn that the most potent of all greenhouse gases is not carbon dioxide, it's not methane, it's not nitrous oxide, or any of these greenhouse gases we hear about, it's water vapour. Water vapour is the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Now there's a reason we don't hear about it very much, is that humans don't really directly modify the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere. 
the way that this actually occurs is that we emit carbon dioxide and all these other greenhouse gases that causes the atmosphere to warm. As the atmosphere warms, it can hold more water vapour, so you get more evaporation, you get more water vapour in the atmosphere, and that's what we call a positive feedback loop. And so the combination of us emitting greenhouse gases and then the positive feedback loop of water vapour increasing in the atmosphere as well is essentially accelerating climate change more than if that wasn't the case. There are other connections, clouds, which are little droplets of water, both reflect um, solar energy back to space, but they also have effects of trapping energy. And this is one of the big scientific uncertainties because we don't know everything about the science of climate change. We don't have perfect projections. And cloud physics and understanding how clouds will change and what, whether they're actually a positive feedback or a negative feedback remains one of the big um, scientific debates. There's other links, um, some of which um, you heard in the previous presentation. If you, the, the solar radiation, uh, sorry, the, the reflection of um, solar radiation from the surface depends on the color essentially of the surface. So if you have ice or snow, as you'll know if you've ever been to the snow, it's very reflective, so you get a lot of the solar radiation reflecting back out. Darker surfaces like ocean um, bodies of water, um, vegetation and so on, tend to absorb more energy. So as the climate warms, you have um, more melting, you have less snow cover, the ice caps are melting, and what that means is that you have darker surfaces that absorb more energy, and the consequence, of course, is another positive feedback loop that you get more warming than you would otherwise. And, and when you see these projections of future temperature change, you see some of the biggest temperature changes in these, these high latitudes where um, that process occurs. So these are just a small number of examples of how the climate processes are linked with water cycling throughout that planet. And the reason I wanted to spend a bit of time on this is because it is not possible to conceive of a future where the atmosphere is getting warmer and there wouldn't be some change to the water cycle. The water cycle has to change in response to climate change. Physically, there's no other possibility. So what might the implications be for us here in South Australia? Well, rainfall is, is clearly important for us. And globally, on average, we expect a small increase in the total amount of rainfall in the world. It's because of some physics around evaporation, how much additional evaporation we might get because of the additional energy and how that gets converted into rainfall. We expect a roughly 2% per degree increase in the total rainfall. But what's more important is the distribution of the rainfall spatially. And this is a, a somewhat old figure now from the, the last intergovernmental panel on climate change assessment, but the ideas are still fairly current. And these are the projections for rainfall change or precipitation change per, as a percentage change per degree of temperature change. And as, um, as I think Mark sort of talked about before, we don't know exactly what the future temperature change is going to be because we don't even know how much we're going to be emitting um, by the end of the century. But we can work out for every degree of temperature change what might happen to rainfall. And the green and the blue colours here are areas of increase. And we can see the higher latitudes and also the tropics are areas where we expect more rainfall occurring. The I guess the mid-latitudes, the drier parts of the world, are where we expect decreases in rainfall by, you know, three, six, up to nine percent. And of course, Australia is one of the regions where we expect to see some of the more significant decreases. So, okay, that, that's a, a substantial change, particularly when we start thinking the possibility that we might have two or three degrees of um, climate change. CSIRO did some more specialised modelling for South Australia, and, and this is a snapshot. Um, this is again by 2090, so it's roughly end of this century, um, looking at changes for different seasons in a large part of South Australia. And you can see the projections are not for a great deal of change in summer and autumn, but potentially substantial changes in winter and spring. And the different colours here are what we assume about what the emissions might be. So the green are relatively low emission changes, um, the red are where we continue essentially emitting as we're currently doing and are expecting some of the more severe impacts. And so we could expect, if we don't do something about it, to get 20 or more percent decline in uh, rainfall in our wet season, essentially, which would have a huge impact on our water availability. And the reason is because the way that rainfall converts into runoff is very nonlinear. So a small change in rainfall means a big change in runoff. And this is some results that we showed um, as part of a, um, a Goiter Institute project um, that concluded a couple of years ago. And basically what we did was we looked at 
Um, so 0% change is essentially you know, business as usual relative to historical baseline. What are the likely changes that might occur in our water availability in South uh, Adelaide's um, surface catchments and by end of century? And we looked at a few different emission scenarios, one really sort of more sort of business as usual and one where we start taking significant measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we can see that, you know, we would, you know, the best, I guess, um, set of, you know, the, the sort of the middle, mid-range of projections uh, were saying potentially a third drop, but a huge amount of uncertainty. Almost no projections are saying an increase in water availability in South Australia. And some of the worst case projections are saying a 75% drop or greater in the water that will come into um, South Australia's water supply. So essentially, the direction is fairly clear. We're expecting a decline in water availability. The magnitude of the change is less clear. It could be anything from you know, a small decline to a absolutely catastrophic um, decline in our water availability in essentially 2070 to 2100. And a reminder that we're already in 2020 almost now, so this is, this is really essentially half a century away. So, okay, that's, that's some projections, and it's, it's showing um, some confidence in terms of what we expect might happen um, here in South Australia. Um, but I want to go to a different side of the coin, which is floods and, and rainfall extremes, heavy rainfall events. And some of you might think, well, if we're facing a drying climate in South Australia, surely that means that we might be, you know, not have to worry about floods quite as much. But some analysis that we did a few years ago again was showing that extreme rainfall globally is increasing by about 7% per degree. So warmer atmospheres can hold more moisture and that moisture is more available for heavy rainfall events. And if you want to think of an intuitive example, anyone who spent any time in, say, the United Kingdom um, will know that it typically drizzles there you know, all the time, very, very moderate rainfall. If you go to the tropics, you tend to get um, these very, very short but very intense downpours. I mean, that's simplifying it a little bit, um, but the idea essentially is that how warm the atmosphere is has a big um, role in determining how heavy rainfall events can be. And so you would think that um, the implication of this is that you would get more flooding. But what we're finding actually is that we can't really find a huge amount of evidence that flood risk is increasing globally. Um, this is a study again by our group um, published last, or two years ago, that basically said that if we look at flood risk globally using a very large number of um, you know, stream flow gauges around the world, we actually found there's more locations where there's declining flood risk than increasing flood risk. Now, I should put a few caveats on this, um, that um, we are looking at relatively frequent floods, um, you know, floods that typically you know, happen every year or every couple of years, um, and this is not a reflection on these really big destructive ev events. And the reason we didn't look at those big destructive events is because actually there's not very much historical data available. Um, you know, we only get a one in a hundred year flood every hundred years, so you don't have good records that you can look at trends in these things as easily. And so, this is a little bit of a scientific conundrum that we are sort of working on and what we think is that essentially catchments can absorb more moisture because in some sense they're drying out a little bit more so they can absorb these heavy rainfall events a little bit. But it really does depend on where you are. Are you in a small urban catchment? Are you in a big rural catchment? Is this storage? Does the catchments have capacity to soak up um, a lot of the moisture or not? It's actually a really complicated space and that's really what I wanted to emphasize with this is that as scientists we still struggle to be able to articulate whether floods because of climate change will be going up or down. And although floods might be going up in some areas, um, the reality is probably going to be quite nuanced in terms of how these things might be changing into the future. And so this really gives um, rise to the last part of my presentation, which is about how do we deal with the fact that we have this massive uncertainty. One of the impacts of climate change that I don't think we talk about enough is okay, climate change is going to cause more droughts and whatever, but climate change also causes more uncertainty because we can't use our historical record um, in the way that we have in the past. We can't just say, well, this is our history of floods, we're just going to assume that everything is going to continue as usual. Or this is the worst drought that we've ever experienced, let's just plan for that drought and think about, you know, that becomes the baseline for any future plans. Because the climate is changing, so we can't rely on those records and say this is what's going to happen in the future. And so do we need to have a new paradigm a new way of decision making under uncertainty. And so there's, there's one way of, I, I sort of want to try to think about how we make decisions currently as, as water resource engineers and as planners in this context of uncertainty. And 
And the dominant paradigm at the moment is what we call risk-based decision-making. And it's basically looking at probabilities of future outcomes and then the consequences of those outcomes. And so you sort of think, well, you know, something might be you know, more likely than, than something else. And then you sort of design you know, your decisions based on your, your willingness to tolerate risk and all that kind of thing. And so water resource managers, I guess, do this sort of thing all the time. So we might design culverts and small you know, bits of infrastructure, um, small roads in, in communities, and we allow them to get flooded every couple of years or every you know, five or ten years. And you know, it's, it's what we call nuisance flooding. It, it kind of you know, might cause a little bit of localised damage. It's, it's unlikely to cause loss of life. It's unlikely to cause you know, major damage to infrastructure. And so we're willing to accept a high level of risk for these sorts of um, situations. On the other hand, a spillway for a major dam or, or you know, major infrastructure we were designed to much rarer probabilities of events. And so as engineers and, and planners, we're very used to thinking in these events and, and in, in these sorts of ways. And essentially, it's a sort of contract that engineers, if you will, have with the public where we sort of say, well, you know, how much risk are you willing to absorb? And then we'll design the system to have that sort of risk. And everyone knows that to absorb more risk um, costs more. And so people think, well, how much am I willing to tolerate and how much am I willing to spend and all that sort of stuff. But we're moving to a different way of thinking, and it's what's called deep uncertainty. So the idea of deep uncertainty is that is a condition in which analysts do not know or the parties to a decision cannot even agree upon the probability distributions to represent uncertainty. So it's like I was to you know, wager a bet, you know, heads of tails in a coin, but I wouldn't even be able to tell you what the chance of a head or a tail would be. And so we're losing one of our mechanisms to make decisions under uncertainty. And this is really challenging us. In terms of flood risk, we don't necessarily know whether flood risk is going to go up or down. But I wouldn't be able to say, well, assume a 50% chance is going to go up, assume a 50% chance is going down. It's just that we're operating in this very uncertain environment where I wouldn't even know how to give you that probability. Um, and so we need to make decisions nonetheless. So how do we start thinking and conceiving about investment in agricultural systems, renewable energy systems, water supply systems, flood protection works, all these other sort of adaptation measures in the light of these sorts of uncertainties? Well, there's a few ways. One is, um, and this is a typology um, um, developed by, by some experts in, in decision making um, under uncertainty, uh, resistance, plan for the worst possible thing that could possibly happen. So it's like building desal plants everywhere to cover 100% of our water needs across every sector, whether it's water supply in towns or agriculture or whatever. It's clearly going to be cost prohibitive. Um, we could do this, but the costs would be outrageous. We can then think about resilient systems. And so it's like, okay, let's allow things to go wrong. Let's, let's allow the, the environment to get flooded. Let's you know, not try to protect against droughts as much as we might. But make sure that if these things happen, we can bounce back more quickly, that we have contingency measures, you know, good emergency responders, all that sort of thing, so that we can make sure that we recover quickly. And so we accept a higher risk of things going wrong, but we know that we have mechanisms in place to adjust. And the final two are really around robustness. And this idea is essentially um, that we try to identify policy options that work against a whole bunch of different possible outcomes. Again, we might want to plan in South Australia for a small decline in water supply or a catastrophic cutoff in our natural catchments that would completely transform how we think about water. And we need to have policies that are adjustable to both. The difference between static and adaptive is how much flexibility we build into the system. Can we make small incremental changes or do we build one big bit of infrastructure that's completely inflexible? Um, and, and that's really when we start thinking about how do we, I guess, plan our systems to deal with uncertain future changes. So that's essentially what I wanted to say. The water cycle must change in response to what have become rapidly um, increasing global temperatures. The prognosis for South Australia is for dry average conditions, potentially by a very large margin because of application of the rainfall runoff process. The prognosis for future floods is actually quite unclear and, and it's not that we don't know anything. You know, some regions might incre have increased risk, some reason, regions might have decreased risk, but it's very, very complex. And the uncertainty of climate change means that thinking, we need to think creativity, cre creatively about developing um, systems that are resilient and robust to a wide range of possible future climate scenarios. So with that, uh, thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Seth. Okay. Seth, I might get... We've just got about five minutes for questions, so I might ask Mark and Seth, did you wanna, do you want to stand up or sit down? Or do you want to... Sorry. So uh, I'll just open up for questions. Because we haven't got much time, if you could um, ask a question, not make a statement, that would, that would help get a few more in. So, yeah. that it? The front here? So, yeah. um, uh, what are the changes to uh, the agriculture sector that um, the water cycle is changing, like with the... Uh, rains happening at the wrong times of the sowing season and such. Are, is that going to be exacerbated with the, change, with the increased changes to the water cycle you were saying? So in terms of the link between when rainfall occurs and the sowing season? Yeah. So the link between, um, I guess, um, changes in rainfall and climate regimes in the agricultural sector is incredibly complex. Um, because it's, it's absolutely it's a time, not just relative to the sowing season, but relative to the growing season, but also the incidence of frost and heat waves and other sorts of things. And then we also have some ability to adapt. So, for example, in wheat, there's a lot of different varieties and we can pick the sowing time and all that sort of stuff, I guess, to try to balance, you know, frost risk and heat wave risk and all those sorts of things. Um, and so these things are very complex. Um, if we think in terms of dry land, you know, that's the situation. If we start thinking in terms of irrigated regions, uh, then we start thinking about water availability, you know, in the Murray-Darling Basin. And I think one thing that we would expect is, um, you know, we've been having all these arguments in the Murray-Darling Basin about, you know, um, returning water to the environment. But it's most of those arguments are about, about a fixed size of the pie. And the pie is potentially going to decrease, potentially by a lot. And so these arguments around um, how do we balance agricultural water with environmental water are, are going to become increasingly contest contested, I suspect, as we start then having to think about a declining availability in total water um, that might happen. The other challenge, I guess, is that we expect, um, because the averages in terms of rainfall are likely to um, increase more slowly than the extremes, we have, I guess, smaller numbers of heavy rainfall events interspersed by longer dry periods, and that's also going to change um, agricultural productivity. And so trying to understand exactly how a particular industry, a particular part of you know, agriculture is going to change because of some of these predictions um, can be quite nuanced, and it really depends on where you are, where do you get your water from, what sort of cropping do you use, what sort of you know, technology um, is available, and, and so on and so forth. I'll just add, add a little bit to that very quickly. Um, Exactly depends on where, where you are and what you do. A really simple perspective is if you're in the temperate zone, so in the cooler parts of the world, uh, you probably get some advantage from climate change, at least in some places. If you're in the um, subtropics and mid-latitudes, which is where we are here in Adelaide, um, then you're probably going to go backwards. And adaptation can take the sting out of climate change, but it probably can't um, take it all away, and so you're probably going to go backwards, even if you adapt well. <coughs> So time for one more question. So the gentleman just here, yeah. Thank you very much for taking my question. I'm, I've, we've heard very good presentations tonight on what the problem is. I thought they were, they were excellent. But frankly, I'm more interested in the solution. And the politicians are not being honest about Sorry, the solution. Sorry, excuse me, sir, do you have a question? Yes, just, I have, I'm okay. getting, oh, it'll be here. I want to know, if we reduced our insane levels of population growth in this country, would it help meet Australia's greenhouse emissions? After all, it is people who drive cars, who need electricity, etc., etc. Australia increases its population nearly 400,000 a year. Sorry, if we so cut sorry, that thank back, you. would me? that help the problem? Thank you. Thank you. Of course, our greenhouse gas emissions are a function of many things, um, including per capita consumption and per capita emissions and, of course, the number of people. Um, yes, we do have very high levels of population growth at the moment, um, and, and I'm sure that uh, this will come into play in terms of uh, policy making. Uh, if it's not feasible um, to actually say it's all due to population growth, if in anything we've actually seen reductions in per capita emissions, and if people weren't living here, they'd be living somewhere else and they'd be emitting somewhere else anyway. Thank you. So just time for one more question. So the gentleman just here. G'day. Thank you for the presentation. So my question really is, 
Um, there's a lot of um, lot of uh, scenarios from uh, of solutions from the scientific side. I want to hear more about from the the social sciences sort of side. I, I want to understand uh, most of these uh, um, the decisions which impact all this climate and um, the damage to it is is controlled by very few sort of wealth and power and that kind of you know nexus. I mean, 70 percent of Australians may think it's a problem. But until the wealth, the capital, the power, they decide it's a problem, it's not going to lead to a solution. So my question is, what kind of changes we require in the system, the social system, to the, the political system, to remove this deep-rooted irrationality and not listening to facts and move to make decisions by taking everyone along rather than dividing people on the issue? Uh, so... So what uh, the psychologists are saying pretty consistently these days is that uh, the perspectives on climate change differ quite radically depending on whether you're somewhere on the spectrum from like a conservative to a progressive and how you view it and what you see as solutions are quite different if you're a conservative versus a progressive. So if you're a conservative, it's about waste reduction, it's about economic efficiency, it's about national, uh, national benefit. If you're on the progressive side, it's much more about equity and... Um, uh, I'm thinking about capability and capacity building um, and justice, so climate justice. So there is no single set of solutions. There is no um, solution to irrationality. Um, what we need to do is actually give people better options than the ones they currently have, and so work towards actually uh, enabling people to make their own decisions, which are better decisions for themselves, for their children, and for the planet. That's great. All right. <laughs> So that's the end of um, session one. If we, could, if we could thank Seth and Mark, please. So if you'd like to just stand up for a minute and just have a, have a stretch, and then we'll head into the next session, and uh, Mark will be chairing that. Okay, if you, if you could take your seats again, please, for the next session. So we've got uh, um, two presentations in the next session, and uh, which are much, much more focused on the economic and regulatory aspects. So just uh, while... Um, uh, Tom is just organising himself. Uh, just to introduce you, um, uh, the next speaker is Professor Tom Compass. Uh, so Tom's at University of Melbourne, uh, is also a affiliate of the Australian National University in Canberra, and he's a uh, um, what you an environmental econ economist, I think, is how you'd describe yourself. Anyway, welcome, Tom. All right. Thank you. Thanks for staying around. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually an applied mathematician and an economist, uh, but still a you know a fairly nice guy, even with that. Um, much of this presentation is based on recently published work, uh, one paper in particular in Earth's Future, but some other work we've been doing um, in terms of integrated assessment models, trying to bring the economics more clearly into the into the climate science going forward, so we can you know, think about the economic damages and costs appropriately. And the way I start this session is, uh, is as follows. It's always the same. Um, economists in the past have largely underestimated the damages from climate change. Uh, this starts with, uh, with the Nordhaus model, the so-called DICE model in the 1990s, where the particular damages from climate change across a wide range of temperature possibilities are relatively small in the neighborhood of 1%, maybe 1.5% of global GDP, the measure of income in the world. Um, this sort of, this sort of uh, thing continues with people like Richard Toll and Roberto Rosan, where damages really are always very small, on average. There's two, there's two possible reasons, I think, for that sort of underestimate that's been going on in the economics field. One is it's very hard to measure these damages. Um, particularly looking forward. That's one particular problem. Second, and I think more importantly, past models, even though they've earned Nobel Prizes recently, past models have really been highly aggregated. They've been highly averaged. The DICE model really has only a small number of regions in the world and assumes one commodity is produced in each country or each one of these regions. They average considerably. And when you average, you miss the extremes. You miss the real damages that come with climate change uh, throughout the world. You saw a bit of this 
In fact, you saw a really nice case of this in Mark's presentation, right? that uh, jellyfish diagram. You get movements in average temperature. That's bad enough. But you get really great variations as a result in extreme temperatures. The variance changes, and the tail becomes more severe. You get much more severe damages as a result in terms of the eco economic damages I want to talk about, given the fact that those things happen. So if you focus on, I hate averages. I can't stand them now. If you focus on average effects, you miss the story. Right? You need to look at the extremes. You need to look at the tails. And that's certainly true in the economics literature. Now, why is this important? It's important because economists are very good at measuring the cost of emissions reduction. They'll tell you how much the electricity bills will increase. They'll tell you what the cost of reducing emissions is. But we have no good measure of what the avoided damages are. Right? You need to know the damages that come with climate change at various temperatures so that you can form, for economists, a benefit-cost comparison. So if we reduce emissions, it's costly, but we'll avoid damages, those are the benefits. What's the trade-off? And until now, we don't have anything like that. We don't have a, a good measure of the damages. I'm going to start. I'm going to give you a good measure. Not a complete measure, right, but it's, it's, a, it's along the way. It's a good measure. Oh. So our task here in this sort of work is to solve a very large dimensional economic model, what's called a, a model that's b based on a GTAP database. And I won't be technical at all. But it's very large dimensional. You look at 140 countries across, across 80 different commodity groups. And you try and build that model to sort of mimic economic activity in each one of those 140 countries. There are firms, there are consumers, there are governments. Firms use inputs like labor, capital, land, natural resources, other intermediate goods to produce output. Consumers either consume or invest. They buy overseas. They buy domestically, governments tax and spend. You can build large dimensional mathematical models that describe the world economy. In each one of these particular cases, we'll talk about for 140 different specific countries. That's what we're doing. We're using a, a GTAP model, which is basically a trade model. It talks about all the various interconnections of traded goods across the world. And in this GTAP framework for 140 countries, across 80 plus commodity groups, and damage functions that come from established work by Rosan and Satori. Look carefully at the damages. This is what we're using so far. The, the numbers I'm going to show you tonight are very large. But the damage functions themselves are relatively limited. The losses are in agriculture and labor productivity that come with increases in temperature, sea level rises that impact on land area, and human health effects. Fairly narrow, but significant damages. Again, for 140 countries, looking forward through time, up to 2100. You can see what's missing, right? We don't have fires and floods. We don't have infrastructure damage. We have some drought effects. We don't have sea level rises that affects infrastructure. We don't have tropical storms. None of that's included yet. We're starting to do that. In fact, we have a tropical storm measure for North America that's pretty robust. But for the global model I'm going to show you for those 140 countries, we're going to focus just on agriculture and labor productivity, sea level rise as it affects land area, and human health effects. We do it for temperature ranges from 1 to 4 degrees, but I'm going to talk tonight about SSP2. What's called SSP2 is business as usual. As I said, these, these models are huge dimensional models. We found a way of solving them. Number of equations and unknowns, half a billion. You need very advanced computational techniques to do so. Here's a picture, a list of the, the 70, 57 commodity groups that we look at. Right? It's pretty broad. It's most of the things we care about. A lot of agriculture, manufacturing, construction, financial instruments, and also a good deal of energy and power components included as well. So we can ask the question, what happens if you switch from fossil fuels to other kinds of things? Here's the first major result. This is a graphic for 140 countries that shows the effect in the long run. Assuming we reach 3 degrees by 2100, 
in terms of percentage change in GDP. GDP is income, basically a measure of income. And the range, of course, is from something fairly small to something greater than 20% fall in GDP. And you can see where the effects are. If you just average, you might not get a very large number. But if you look at individual effects across countries in particular, you get very large numbers. And indeed, I'll show you the actual numbers in a minute. You can see Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, in particular, suffer pretty severe damages. That's a, the three degree path. What do the numbers look like? You can see the, the damages are distributed in a very uneven way. What do the numbers look like? Well, here you go. So these are the damage. These are all in billions. You've got to be very careful counting zeros here. It's even irritating to me. The numbers get very large. These are all in billions of dollars. So at two degrees, it's, it's, it's $5,600 billion. That's about $5 trillion in damages. At three degrees, about $9.5 trillion in damages. I'll talk more about what that means in a minute. And at four degrees, about $23 trillion in damages. You can see it's nonlinear in its effect. The further the temperature increase, the more severe, in fact, the damages are. Um, and they're, again, they're distributed in a non-uniform way. Africa gets pounded, Southeast Asia, India, even the United States occurs some damages. Here's Australia, which I'll talk about later. What do the big numbers mean? What's 23 trillion mean? What's 5 trillion mean, for that matter? Well, if you remember the global financial crisis in 2008 and the damage that caused globally, 23 trillion is about three or four of those. So the picture I just showed you, or the, 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 the particular dollar amounts I just showed you, were dollar damages in the year 2100, every year, year after year, in perpetuity. I'll show you the cumulative damages in a minute, from now until 2100. But that's the 2100 year damages. That would, that would tell you at 23 million, you'd have three or four GFCs each year in perpetuity. That's the economic damage. Even at two degrees, you have, you have one and a half or one and a bit GFC each year, year after year. Quite substantial. Okay. But look at, look at how they're distributed. Some country losses are especially severe. Right? Indonesia, 19% fall in GDP. Singapore, 16%. The Philippines, 20%. Much of Africa from 18 to 26% fall in GDP. These are massive catastrophic falls in gross national product or income. As a reference point, you can see that during the Great Depression of the 1930s, global losses were about 15% in GDP. So for many countries, it's almost double that or certainly in that neighborhood. You can see the effect in Australia, which again, I'll come back and talk about later. About 14,000 per household, even with a limited set of damage functions. So that's 2100. It's in, within someone's lifetime, potentially, who's born, born today. But what do the cumulative damages look like? Well, before we do that, just look at, look at the benefit of, of, of complying with the Paris Accord. Right? All you have to do is look at the differences. Right? If you're at two degrees relative to no warming, you earn about five trillion. The difference between two degrees and four degrees is about 17 trillion. So if you could hold the two degrees, the benefit of complying with the Paris Accord is about 17 trillion dollars. It's massive. Those are the damages. Those are the, in effect, the avoided damages if indeed you do comply with the Paris Accord. Now, the cumulative damages. Let me show you these. Ask yourself what happens from 2017 to 2100. Add up all the damages in these particular damage functions that we've looked at going forward in time. What are the totals? Well, then they, they really do blow out. Right at two degrees, these are big numbers again. These are in billions of dollars. So this would be $171 trillion, $271 trillion, and $604 trillion. 
You can see they're just massive. You can see why insurance companies are really in a panic. These are huge damages, which incur huge liabilities. Quite profound. How am I doing? Okay. Even in Australia, which in this graphic, in this sort of model context, remember we don't have fires and floods yet. We don't have sea level effects on infrastructure. Even in this sort of modeling, Australia in fact takes a rather large hit. Right at four degrees, almost three trillion. One trillion at three degrees. One last picture to show you before I wrap up. You often hear it said that, that uh, countries that don't generate a lot of emissions are the ones that take the burden of, of climate change. And this modeling work allows you to show this quite clearly. Just look, look at it for a second. This is mean, mean GDP or mean income in the world. And I put in some country identifiers. On this side is the impact in terms of falls in GDP. So 20% is a fall in income in GDP. 10% in GDP. Pick out some of the countries. This is the Philippines, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Brazil, China. A lot of African countries in here, Nigeria, a lot of African countries, Ghana. Right? They're all below mean income. The ones who aren't as severely affected so far, save for Singapore, are the ones like these. Right, Japan, Australia, Canada, the USA, Luxembourg. Right. It drives home the point that the, the sort of sort of the ethical problem that goes with this sort of effect in the world. It's the poorest countries who will suffer the most. But of course, those poorest countries are generally speaking in the neighborhood, particularly for Australia. And indeed, the spillover effects that can be quite profound. Last slide, and then I'm right on time. Two final points. First, we can't average. Right? We've got to think about the tails of the distribution, where the significant damages are. And you saw the significant damages vary a lot by country. They tend to be around the equator, but they start to drift up as well as temperatures increase. And these falls in GDP, if you understand the numbers, even if you only have a loose handle on the numbers, 23 trillion, 603 trillion, trillions and trillions of dollars. These numbers are devastating. Just imagine a 20% fall in GDP in the Philippines. What does that tell you? When income falls, of course people are unemployed, and tax revenues fall. Tax revenues start to fall dramatically at the same time. There's an increase in the number of natural disasters which require emergency revenues, emergency expenditures to try and offset those disasters. It affects even countries like the United States or Australia. Right? If you get falls in GDP, you get falls in revenues. Poor government, but also increase in expenditures that go with climate change. For most of those countries, it would be a catastrophic meltdown. You couldn't survive with falls in 20, 25% in GDP. Even 10%, even 5% is pretty huge. Right, we worry now when the, the growth rate in Australia goes from three to two percent. If it goes from four to two percent in the United States for two consecutive quarters, it's a recession. You know, these numbers far dwarf those numbers, really quite severe. Sorry, I can't be a, a happier person about it. But the good thing is that we know what the damages are. We know if we avoid them, it'll be a huge saving. Six hundred and three trillion at four degrees in fact, warming. I also know in this model context just recently what the cost of emissions reduction is, and it's less than 100 trillion. So you spend less than 100 trillion, you save 600 trillion in damages. Who wouldn't do that? Why can't we do that? Right? We should be able to do that. We know how to do it. And the economics now is clear. The benefits far exceed the cost, far exceed the cost, regardless of what you read in the Australian newspaper. Thanks very much. So thanks, Tom, for that. Um, so you can just swap over the microphone. Oh, thank you. So um, our, our next speaker is Cathy. Uh, so uh, Cathy Armour, who's uh, uh, the Commissioner for ASIC, the Australian Security Investment Commission.
And Catherine today is talking about uh, climate risks and opportunities, particularly in relation to regulatory approaches. Uh, welcome, Cathy. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank, thanks for coming along. And um, we've heard, heard tonight some pretty frightening, I guess, um, uh, analysis about climate change from both a scientific, a weather, and an economic perspective. Um, now, from our perspective at ASIC, we are, a, you probably all know, we're not a shoe company, we're the, the corporate regulator, and our, one of the things we care about is ensuring that there is a strong, fair, and efficient financial system for all of, all of us in Australia. And so the impact of climate change is an issue from our perspective that is increasingly important. Can, oh, you can't hear me? Sorry. It, I've, got, I've put the microphone in the wrong spot. Is that better? Okay, thanks. And yell out again if, if it slips. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's a rookie error to wear a dress to when you have a, a microphone on your label, uh, label so I apologise. Um, so, going, so from ASIC's perspective, we care about climate risk to the extent that it has an impact on our financial system. And ASIC and the other domestic regulators in, who have an input into the financial system have been doing a, quite a degree of work recently at looking at the potential impact of climate risk to our system. APRA, which is the regulator that looks at the prudential soundness of our banks, our insurance companies and our superannuation companies, has been looking at this from a soundness perspective. ASIC, APRA and the our Reserve Bank of Australia, who form part of the Council of Financial Regulators, have a working group that looks at climate risk. Um, so we, we're interested in it. We also participate in um, an international organisation um, the, called IOSCO that is interested in, um, in the climate risk from a regulatory perspective. So what I want to do today is just run through a different sort of lens to the issue. And that lens is more of a legal and regulatory lens. And what I'm going to do is take you through um, that the legal and regulatory underpinnings and then take you to some work that we've done recently and this, this slide just highlights that work. Um, so the context that we look at um, climate risk is um, builds on um, some definitions that a group called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure have built. Now this work is actually quite significant from a financial pers perspective. The Task Force is a group um, that's been sponsored by the G20 um, org uh, established organisation called the Council of the Financial Stability Board. So it's a group of the largest 20 countries in the, uh, economies in the world. Their central banks and other key policymakers actually set up an, a group who issued a report in 2017 to um, encourage some harmonisation of discussion about what are climate related risks when you're talking about them from a financial perspective. And um, this, this um, group divided climate related risks into two categories, transition risks. So they're the risks that, that relate to the transition to a low carbon economy and obviously the physical risks that is risks that arise because of changes to the weather system. Also, um, noteworthy that this group looked at also climate opportunity and recognised that actually from um, some, some of the changes in the climate um, uh, that climate change is, is creating, there will be opportunities for people who or businesses that have a, d a different business model. Now these concepts are important because they frame the way that we, we say as a regulator companies, particularly listed companies, and their directors and their senior managers, management should be thinking about climate um, risk. Why is that important? Well, under the laws that we administer, there are some basic fundamental requirements. Um, and those requirements are, um, apply um, to companies and the individuals who, um, who run the company, so the directors and management, and also 
to the way the companies interact with and make disclosures to their investors and their other stakeholders. So if we look first of all at what are the requirements for company management, um, basically the law in Australia requires company directors to act with due care and diligence, in good faith, proper purpose and in the best interests of the company. You may remember some of that from um, um, your own days at university or your economics courses. So these, these notions are called generally called director's duties. Now, a couple of years ago, a memorandum was prepared by a QC um, that considered director's duties in the context of climate change. And the conclusion in that opinion, um, which we ASIC agree with in principle, is that it is possible for directors who fail to consider climate change risks now, so today, actually could be found li liable in the future for breach of their duties as a director. Um, now, obviously, the business operations of companies vary very widely, and there's a whole range of different ways that directors and senior managers need to understand and reassess the material risks of their businesses. Um, but we say that that extends to thinking about both the physical and transitional climate risks that I mentioned before. So we, we think it's an obligation on company directors and management to consider climate risks and to ensure that there is a strong and effective corporate governance practices um, within the company so that they can continually test and assess whether they're dealing with climate risk. Um, now, just as recently as this January, the World Economic Forum released its Global Risk Report, and in that report, um, extreme weather events and failure to mitigate or adapt to climate change were identified as two of the three um, global risks, both in terms of likelihood and impact for business. So uh, we, we can't underline enough how important the, that, that particular issue is for company management. Um, so on to disclosure. So the, the law in Australia requires that directors produce a report, um, an annual report once a year, that it contains information that helps investors to make an informed assessment about the, that entity's operations, its financial position, its business strategies, and its, its future prospects. Now, that section is usually referred to as the Operating and Financial Review, um, and we say that it's likely to be misleading for directors to discuss companies' prospects for a future financial years if they don't identify their material business risks, risks that could affect the achievement of those prospects. And that, depending on the company's business operations, could very well include climate risk. On the other hand, we expect that companies um, who have a climate opportunity as part of their business strategy need also to disclose that. Um, and again, there are other sorts of disclosures that Australian companies are required to make so if they're doing a capital raising, they need to produce a prospectus document, which again, we would expect the companies turn their mind to whether there's a need for a climate risk disclosure. And, and also companies own an obligation to the market to keep them informed of the material developments, their business, that's called a continuous disclosure obligation. And again, we expect that they, these sort of risks are contained. And of course, we've seen in many, recent years Many companies um, actually report in a separate environmental, social and governance or ESG report. Now, so again, which is a practice that we, we heartily endorse. Um, there are actually a plethora in the hundreds of voluntary climate disclosure frameworks which have emerged over the years. But the T TCFG reporting framework, which I mentioned earlier, is emerging from the PAC as a framework of choice and we're encouraging listed companies um, to actually, who have a, a material exposure to climate risk, to con consider reporting under this um, arrangement. And we understand that many of the top 100 listed companies are considering that. Um, now, we've all seen that investors, both in Australia and internationally, are playing a much stronger role in the push for the provision of meaningful and useful climate risk disclosure. 
and a couple of examples of this you might be interested in. The Australian Shareholders Association in a recent public submission to our Securities Exchange, the Australian Securities Exchange, stated that listed companies with material exposure to climate risks should be encouraged to report under the TCFG framework I mentioned. The Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, or AXI, has for some time been calling for greater levels of climate risk disclosure. And you can imagine why climate risk is an important, um, an important issue for AXI's members, uh, superannuation funds who have long-term investment requirements. Um, BlackRock, which is internationally one of the world's largest asset managers, has called for companies to um, report climate risk in line with the TCFD's recommendations. Um, you probably saw in recent weeks um, media reporting of Glencore, which is one of the largest um, coal producers, in, certainly in Australia, um, if not globally, who announced a limit on its um, annual production of coal, driven, we understand, in part by investor feedback. And IOSCO, which is a group of um, securities regulators like ASIC on an international basis, has also, in a statement, on ESG matters um, actually uh, uh, repeated the, the call that investors are interested in this ESG disclosure. Um, and uh, we see that there's just an increasing level of interest here. We've also, we canvassed the annual general meeting, um, uh, annual general meetings of listed companies that are held each year. And we've noticed that there's strong le levels of shareholder interest, increasing number of questions from the floor about climate risk. So we expect that investors will continue to pressure as listed companies to make those sorts of disclosures. Um, and I think we probably all heard recently a discussion about a, co a company's social licence to operate. It's in becoming increasingly clear that um, corporate activity is often um, assessed by reference to um, how that company um, engages with the risks and opportunities um, in the broader the, the broader community and people who whether they're investors, creditors or customers of a company consider um, whether or not they'd like to deal with a company having regard to this, this broader social licence. Um, now there's obviously been developing literature around broader um, social licence, corporate social licence, um, and we're looking, we're looking forward to seeing how that develops. Um, there was some discussion recently, there's ASX put out new corporate governance principles. At one stage there's a proposal that companies actually dis, um, publicly report on that, their social, how they were meeting their social licence to operate. That hasn't found its way to the final principles, but it, this is obviously another area of discussion that's growing. Um, but finally, um, let's just ask ourselves how well are Australian listed companies addressing climate change in their regulatory disclosure? Last year, we looked at climate risk disclosure um, by 60 listed companies in the ASX 300. In 25 um, prospectuses for um, initial public offering and across 15,000 annual reports. Um, our fa foundings were a little bit disappointing. Um, we found that the majority of the ASX 100 companies in our sample had to some extent considered climate risk to their company's business. 40% of those ASX companies cited climate, climate risk as a material risk in their operating and financial review. But when we looked at the broader sample of ASX 300 companies, and just for perspective, it's about 2,300 listed companies on the Australian Securities Exchange, so this is really just the, the largest of those companies. Only 17% of the ASX 300 listed companies um, cited climate risk as material. So we found disclosure practices to be disappointingly fragmented and inconsistent. Um, we found that many of the disclosures were far too general and not comprehensive enough to be useful for investors. And out of the top 200 ASX companies, we found um, limited climate risk disclosures. Unfortunately, as you can probably gather from these slides, we also found that the reporting isn't necessarily getting better. 
um, over time. Um, we are hoping that we see um, the, the framework that I mentioned earlier um, becoming accepted, that there will be more, um, more satisfactory reporting, more ownership of reporting on these issues in the future. Um, so our expectation of listed companies and their directors and senior management is very simple. First, they need to consider climate risk. Um, two, they need to develop and maintain strong and effective corporate governance, which helps identify, assess and manage the climate risk along with other material risks. Um, they need to comply with the law, which just requires disclosure of material business risks. Um, and fourth, fourthly, they need to disclose useful information to investors. So that's why we recommend that um, companies start to um, report where they, where they can, where it makes sense for them under the TCFD framework. So I hope that gives you a bit of a perspective of the existing regulatory environment and, and, how, is impact, and how climate risk is intersecting with um, the financial system here. Thanks very much. Okay. And, uh, um, Tom, if you grab a, a microphone and a seat, and, uh, and we'll just uh, have some questions from the audience. Uh, so, questions? Um, okay, um, so, just in there. Mr. Just push it up, yeah. Yeah. Uh, many thanks to Tom for clarifying the cost uh, of uh, climate change. Um, I wonder if it would send a clear financial signal uh, if we invited companies that export fossil fuels to pay 1% of the expected cost of climate change. Do you think that would be an effective uh, measure? So, um, am I okay? Yeah. Working? Okay. Oh, sorry. Should I turn mine off? Um, yeah, I'm on. I'm on board. Uh, but, but, but most economists, of course, would, like myself, would, would argue for a price on carbon to begin with. And indeed, we saw that uh, a price on carbon can indeed be very effective. Both, you know, absolutely. It's not, it's not hard to do. So, I mean, that's the first best step. If you, com if you combine a price on carbon with subsidies for renewables, you can get to something like a nice SSP1 outcome. Um, fairly quickly, in a sense. So, yeah, that's the key. Thank you very much uh, for your presentations. It appears to me that from what we've heard tonight, this country is going to have to stop mining and selling coal. Just don't, don't now, make now just I'll have a question. I'll get to the question very quickly, sir. Tom, does your does your model include that possibility? So, if you the model at the moment that I presented tonight was just about the damages that go with a certain kind of scenario, what's called SSP two. But if you look at a transition to a better world, in fact, coal has to be phased out, phased out relatively quickly, and and that's just quite clear. Um, a price on carbon, of course, will also be you know, needed, right? because it's not just coal, it's other kinds of fossil fuels as well and other kinds of pollutants. And indeed, you'll need to find a way to compensate individuals who have to you know, pay for the price on, on carbon as a result. But it's possible. The solution's there. I mean, we know how to do it. We just need the political will to do it. So, thanks for your presentation, Tom. Um, one. One question, the um, cost of conflict in the world, particularly, particularly Syria, I believe is climate related and probably many other areas where we've got um, civil wars and, and conflicts in Africa are related to, to climate change. Does any of that cost uh, um, come into your calculation? Yeah, not, not yet. In, in particular, not the cost of natural disasters, which is the things that we're working on at, at the moment. But you can already see it in, in, in Latin America and South America, where you're getting severe falls in GDP that are climate-induced effects. And they start marching north, north, right? They start, they start trying to approach the U.S. border. Um, 
I don't want to talk about Trump, but, but you know, you can see the effects already. You know, you get severe disruption, even with, with still relatively minor increases in temperature. It's not part of the calculations. I've already left a lot of things out. But what's there is enough to justify taking action, right? I wouldn't have to do much more work to justify taking action. It's already there, right? $603 trillion in cumulative damages at 4 degrees with an emissions reduction scheme that's less than $100 trillion by any measure you look at. So you're getting a really big payoff. Sounds like a good deal to me. Um, so there's one in the middle. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir and ma'am, for your presentations. Um, my question is for uh, Mrs. Tom. Um, the question is that today we live in a world where um, we can produce solar electricity uh, at a cheaper rate than uh, coal-based energy. And we have electric cars, which are doing really good and they are sustainable. And I don't know how many uh, present here are aware about uh, the contribution of animal agriculture industry that uh, contributes to greenhouse gas emissions uh, contributed by human sources. So again, we live in a world where we have uh, other alternative for food sources which are quite sustainable. So my question is that what is stopping us from moving towards the right thing, I mean, towards making the right choices? Is it the politicians or people who are influencing them, or is it the common people who are not doing their part? And I want to ask that why sustainability cannot become a profitable business? Oh. Well. Um. Uh, the main the main source of emissions are fossil fuels, of course, oil, oil, coal, and gas. And without a price on carbon, if you had a price on carbon, you'd start to traverse more quickly away from those fossil fuels into renewables, as you suggest. And indeed, in many cases, the price of the cost of renewables is already far less than than uh, new coal co co power uh, po uh, power plants. So I mean, it's cost effective to get out of coal, but a price on carbon will make that happen much quicker and you need it to happen quicker so that you avoid the uh, temperature increases uh, you know, in the future. Uh, the politics, uh, I'll leave that up. Maybe Mark can handle that one. You want to handle that one? I mean, there are, there are big vested interests at stake here, particularly in my, my home country, the United States. Um, uh, the oil and gas industry is very powerful. Um, that's part of the problem. Kathy, did you have a response on that one? No? Well, um, I look, I. I definitely don't have a response on, on any of the, the politics but I, I do think that um, we're all um, through our superannuation investments making investments every day in um, our financial system and I think um, if, you, if you're concerned about how um, that, those sort of investments are made it's it's certainly something that you can actually take up um, th through your superannuation fund or by moving your your, um, your superannuation into a into a fund where, where those issues are are important in investing. So it is something that you don't have to. Um, you know, there are, and I guess that was the point of my presentation. There are exact existing requirements for disclosure about key risks. If climate's a key risk for a business that needs to be disclosed, we're all capable of having a look, seeing whether the disclosure's been made by a particular company, asking, asking the, or the firms that, that make our, invest our superannuation what their attitude is to that and, and addressing that. So we've got a question there. And then um, any other questions uh, for Cathy in particular, because Tom's quite a few. So. Uh, yeah, this is one for Cathy. Thank you. Um, I'm not generally much of an economist, so excuse me if I don't refer to the right acronyms. Um, I'm just curious how, if you happen to know, how many of the AX300 companies that did disclose information regarding risk, climate risk factors in their prospectuses, 
how many, if any of them, have a direct role in their businesses involved in fossil fuels, such as mining or gas? And how is, is ASIC or is there somewhere where those of us who kind of almost understand superannuation could go and get a Clapham omnibus version of companies and superannuation funds that we could put our superannuation into so that we're not inadvertently supporting something that we quite obviously don't want to be. Right. So I, I, um, do, I don't know um, the names of superannua superannuation firms have particular um, investment ethics, if you like, um, or investment strategies that I would recommend. I, that's just not really appropriate for us to do. Um, but I don't think it would be that difficult to actually ask that question of your own superannuation fund. Or, as I mentioned, I know that AXI, which is one representative um, industry body for a group of superannuation funds, there are others. Um, we'll have some information to hand, so do f you should feel free to contact them about that. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the large companies on in the um, ASX, um, particularly ASX 100, do make quite significant disclosures about climate risk, particularly the larger mining companies. So going to their website, you will find quite detailed discussions about that. Interestingly, I think it's a question about uh, businesses that might have a more indirect, um, where climate risk may not be so obvious. It seems obvious, at least to me, but I probably should defer to Mark, was that perhaps mining companies would have an, an impact, like similarly ag um, agricultural companies. But there, there are probably a number of enterprises where the climate risk impacts are much more indirect. And it's quite in, it'd be quite interesting to really think about um, whether the disclosure there is, is good enough and is helpful enough for investors um, for those companies. Um, I have another question for, for Cathy. Thank you for both of your presentations. I imagine this is early days, but do you know if there has been any litigation anywhere or if there is any litigation happening right now anywhere uh, against companies for not complying with re re regulatory requirements around climate change? Gosh, I, I think there has been quite significant um, litigation uh, globally about um, environmental issues which um, which companies have not disclosed. Um, whether or not the particular environmental issue is a follow-on from um, a climate event, a climate-related event, I'm probably not unqualified to say, but definitely there has been. In New South Wales, um, earlier this um, year, a Land and Environment Court actually did uh, prevent a, um, a development in, um, I think it was in the Hunter Valley, um, which what would have been, I think, and I may not recall this exactly, but would have been a new, I think it was a coal mine. One of the reasons that was cited in the court's decision was actually this new mine was would not assist um, the country to meet its Paris Accord obligation. So I think the, these sorts of thoughts are, are becoming relevant in, in sort of court cases and judicial matters. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the question relates to the, the carbon pricing, which has been mentioned a lot, uh, and the disclosure of companies. Uh, so I know that BHP and Shell sort of factor in a future carbon price into some of their statements. Uh, around the ASX, how many companies would you, uh, would, would you say are actually factoring in a carbon price? Because if you think about how, how little time we have, the last thing we want is for a carbon price to come in and then companies start thinking about it. Are they thinking about it now uh, in general? 
So um, I think I don't know the precise answer to that question. What I can say is we did find that at the moment there's, it looks like there's real pat it's very patchy the amount of thinking that's going into future climate risks. So as you mentioned, some companies are, are obviously factoring in as clearly a material risk for them. Others don't don't seem to be reporting on it. It may be that they, they have valid reasons for them to say it's not a material risk. Um, but yes, it's very patchy and it sort of tends to suggest that people may, uh, may not be thinking at, about it the way we'd, we would think that they should. Last question. Hi. Um, I've been, uh, I'm Scottish and I've, uh, I'm a new uh, citizen here in Australia. But I, I just feel that this is 2007 all over again. And hello, the evidence is out. If all the stuff and the energy that was there in 2007 when Kevin Rudd was trying to do this stuff, it would all be not different, but if what, if what I want to say is this. Can, can you ask a question? Uh, my question is, would it be different if if, if the, all the energy that happened then in 2007, this is the same energy? Oh, sorry. Okay, the, you a bit more of a statement. There is one We're last one at the back. Oh, you it. Oh, it's, um, there's one, one last one at the back. I think we'll go for that. Um, so, so let's let's be positive about that, and what, I think we're actually in a different position than we were now because we know some of the dead ends we shouldn't go down, um, and we have learned a little bit in the process, I suspect. So, um, one question up there. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you for. Okay, thank you for your, your informative presentations. Um, as you said earlier, there's, uh, you can see there's 70% of Australians who want to uh, do something about climate change. And uh, from your data, you can see that obviously there's something happening with climate change and we need to make a change. As scientists, how do you suggest that you go about presenting the data to sort of the people who make the decisions who may not have backgrounds in these areas in a way that can sort of get across the point that a lot of people want to make change and what the actual problems are that need addressing. Do you, do you want to pick that up? So I, I, think, I think the message is there. I mean, at one point in 2007, the Republican Party in the United States was in favor of introducing a price on carbon. Uh, um, things changed radically when bad information started being, being put out. Um, in social media and in Fox News and all kinds of places, and that still happens. Um, I think the best bet now for Australians is to vote Labor, um, and, and that's, that's, that's about it. And I, I think they get the message, and uh, um, they, they waffle on Adani a bit at the moment, but let's see what happens. I think they get the message, though. So, Cathy, did you want to comment there? Look, um, just from the perspective of a regulator, um, the laws that we um, enforce, you know, require us to ensure that people get the information they can to assess material risks. I think scientists have a real, a real role to play because you can assist us to identify situations where those risks haven't been uh, well documented, aren't being, aren't being properly reflected, and. Um, if we are in a position where there has been something mis that's misleading and we need to take legal action, we absolutely need the benefit of expert opinions to do so. So I think there are lots of things that, um, that scientists could certainly assist in our, in our role um, with. So, okay. so I'll take the Chairman's prerogative and just uh, finish off with a comment there, is that uh, for, for me, uh, the, the point that Cathy was just making is that uh, when it comes down to business decision making, um, you have to take responsibility for getting good information um, and, and incorporating that, that into decisions. And so, so there is a responsibility for the business in that case, or it may be in governments or various others, to actually um, make sure that the information is 
robust and reliable. Um, there is also, I think, an onus on science, scientists to actually make the information contextual and appropriate um, where they're engaged, but often there isn't a direct responsibility on scientists to do that. Um, it's actually often an option. Um, people like me engage with decision makers not because I get paid to do it, because I feel it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, what we say, see from psychology, though, is that it's not um, about uh, scientists or um, regulators that a lot of people want to take information from. It's actually respected peers. And if you can get respected peers who are champions of climate change within different sectors or different industries, they're often the ones who actually have most leverage and that's who people learn from the most. And the last thing which is really important is the broader culture um, in which those decisions are being made. So, for example, if you look at um, Europe, so the, the Carbon Disclosure Project report for last year in Europe uh, indicated 75% of companies in their survey were actually taking climate change into account. 50% of those said that there were opportunities associated with climate change, so it wasn't negative, it was actually seeing opportunity there. And 47% of those companies actually had some sort of incentive for staff and directors to take climate change into account. And so there's a huge gap between what we're seeing in other jurisdictions, like in Europe, and what we're seeing in Australia. And the big question is how do we actually get from where we are to where they are and pops further? Because if you actually think about Europe is much, much less climate sensitive than Australia is much less climate exposed, we should be way ahead of them rather than them way ahead of us. So I hope that helps. Anyway, just to, to bring it all to a close, I just want to um, thank uh, everyone for their participation tonight. Great questions from the floor. Um, some really great presentations. Um, thank you, Sandy, for chairing, and, and thank you uh, for hosting here at Adelaide. So thank you very much. Cheers.